Hello, welcome to Big 20, where we go behind the GM screen. I'm your host, Dan. I'm joined by... This is Mike. And I'm Eric. What are we talking about this week, Eric? Why are we named Big 20? What the hell is that all about? That's Big a good place 20. to start person. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Um, so we decided to move our weekly podcast, or often weekly podcast, over to video. And we're going to kind of focus it, guide it a little bit more GM centric, at least for the time being. And so you rack your brain, what do you call a show? Um, And I'd say for a good, what, month, month or so, we uh, bounce back and forth a couple, probably a hundred different names until it struck me that a good emote, thinking forward, forward thinking, a good emote would be Big 20, because to us, Big 20 is a very special green dice um, that uh, our dear friend Brian uh, used. Eric? Yeah, Big 20 was, uh, it was a green, like, gemstone 20-sided dice. It wasn't much to speak of. It wasn't really, like, overly, like, gorgeous or anything like that. The It had a, a design flaw where... Uh, the 20 was like two font sizes bigger, one font size. It, it, it was significantly bigger than all of the other, uh, all of the other numbers on the dice itself. And, you know, of course we're, yeah, for, but, uh, for years we looked to try to find the nut, like this particular type of dice, cons, game stores. Kind of like that. Very, right. Yes. That's right. That translucent green. But the 20 was huge, right? It was, it was abnormally it was, large abnormal so it became this symbol for brian because brian was very superstitious about his big 20 um mike uh what did he always call his big 20 what was the question it wasn't a fighter what was it oh no no big 20 is a lover right Right. he would only ever pull out this big 20 for charisma (laughs) checks or yeah it wasn't known for combat right this was back in the day um what we would call probably the three three five era um so diplomacy was huge diplomacy bluffing all of that was huge with all the brian's characters oh, he, would he, pull out big yeah. 20. he wanted the best of both worlds he wanted uh to be the diplomancer with the high diplomacy and he also wanted to be the strong fighter well and i to to brian's credit this was before diplomancer as a concept really existed in, he was in doing print. it and he wasn't realizing it right um what was <laughs> he was saying? innovating uh, uh the yeah, diplomancer yeah, yeah. and to be fair he was power gaming it right what, oh fuck yeah he was <laughs> he's a noble uh, he's a woodsman locksmith of noble birth right right to, to right. get everything he could possibly want yeah, where, the, where the hell did that even come from? Yeah, Mike, you let this happen. So explain <laughs> to us, right? You enabled that. Uh, <laughs> go, let's go behind the GM screen. I, I want to know your thinking uh, behind Jason it. might remember that backstory on that one better. Uh, I think it was just Brian's way of not being uh, committed to a background for his character. You know, he wanted to be like this, uh, you know, real humble village kid from the village, the woodsman. But then, you know, he thought, well, maybe his stock and trade was something more, you know, fancy like locksmith. Because he wanted to pick locks also. But then, you know, he wanted to, his character wanted to impress the women, so he, he's noble birth, you know, going to be that prince in disguise thing. So He was, he was very much a, a Mary Sue. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, so his, it just kind of got bigger as it went along. So to to kind of put a, a frame around this, why Big 20 is important to us, unfortunately, Brian was taken from us very young. And um, we 
put Big 20 in his hand uh, when, mm-hmm. when we buried him. Uh, it was very important to, to us because it was, it was a symbol. Um, if I remember correct, uh, the miniature that I painted for him, Mike, you have? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mortellan. Um, mm-hmm. I thought Mortellan was going in there also. I'm, I, I, I'm glad that you kept it. And something that we can pass on uh, yeah. maybe one day. I think he had a hockey jersey on and the big 20. I don't know what else. Right. So yeah. the, the story of big 20 to me to frame in, in GM terms is the story of player superstition. And how, how, how can we use that uh, as a tool in our GM, GM arsenal in order to create a better game, create tension, create story opportunities? Right. Yeah, and that's, um, as, a, as a game master, especially a game master who knows their players so well. I mean, the, what we're talking about is very likely a... Uh, a long-term game that you've played with friends, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I mean, you can pick up, people are pretty, you know, they, they've got a lot of um, idiosyncrasies that you can probably pick up just within talking to them or just watching them, you know, um, like uh, one of our friends, um, and we know more than just one person, but one of our friends likes to line her dice up, you know, in uh-huh. order and, right. and whatnot. And, you know, if you want to, you want to mess with her and our friend Jason loves to mess with her. Boom. You know, rat rattle her by messing up her dice. And 20 side up uh, is something that I've seen (laughs) everywhere. Right. I've, I've worked in game shops. Mm -hmm. We've been to cons for at this point decades uh, because we're the old, we're the old guard and people do this everywhere. Right. This is, this is a very common superstition uh, among gamers. Right? And, and when you ask why someone does that, they always say the lamest shit. Right. You know, it's always like, oh, so the atoms can settle. And it would, it's uh, like, I, you know that it, it doesn't really do that, right? You'd have to like set it there for what, you know, a thousand years right. or some shit? To her credit, <laughs> uh, our friend that we are referring to, Brandy, she is very <laughs> honest about the fact that it's just her OCD, right? And, <laughs> and that's fine. Um, but we, we see this everywhere. Uh, no, another superstition that that was brought up when I first joined your group th- at this point, decades ago, whenever I was like fifteen or sixteen, they always said never name your horse, and I always yeah. wondered about this. Never and over the horse. years, it finally, like the story, finally came out. But nobody ever named their horse, Mike. Why did nobody name their horse? <laughs> You know, I don't really remember that one, but it might have something to do with like, you know, you don't want to get attached to uh, a vehicle or, uh, you know, you, you, if you do fix that place up, you know, you don't, you know, they're not too attached to it. It's some kind of attachment thing where you're going to lose it. It's just, right. It's right. a bad luck thing. Attached to it. Yeah. It becomes something that the GM can then exploit or take away. And it was that fear, that superstition whether or not you ever would have done anything, uh, the the threat was there, the fear was there. Um, right. I always so, thought it was yeah. uh, you, you don't you don't name you don't want somebody in their party naming their horse because I'm not going back into a danger zone to rescue a horse. <laughs> to rescue a horse. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, uh, I'll go back into a uh, you know to rescue a party member, but but fuck your horse. I'm not. I don't care about your horse. <laughs> so horse. you know, it's, and that's why I always like you know uh, didn't like uh, um, people who had fantastic steeds or mounts or or uh, you know just even companion animals. You better keep track of your freaking companion animal because I'm not going to go back into that dungeon to go and, and find your dog. Well, we put, let's put this, uh, let's, let's give this some legs, right? Uh, for the longest time, I don't know that this is so much the case anymore, um, would be a paladin's mount, right? A paladin's mount is a very special thing. It's, a, it's, it's an important piece of their kit and you're going to name it, right? You're going to get attached to it. Um, and, I th- and that gives it more personality, but the more personality that it has, the longer you have it, the more important it is, the greater the loss 
when it is gone. And like chat says, you leave it outside the dungeon. Leave it outside. It's eaten by wolves. That's right. So these are, these are all <laughs> named things. horses, dead horse. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I think we see this all over the place. Uh, our current campaign that we're playing, uh, Mike is my GM. And I decided that I wanted to play a fighter. And I always love the idea of a fighter who had an, an, a, a companion attack dog, a Rottweiler, like somebody who was trained, like, like an, a trained attack dog. And I was at, from the outset, I said, Mike, if you kill my dog, we are going to have problems. <laughs> and, and I prefer, <laughs> I prefer the parts the, I Isn't that the, the like dog. the John Wick uh, answer to that? Oh, yeah. If, if Mike <laughs> kills my dog, he's done. Done. Mm. Yeah, killing a dog's cruel. You know, yes, horse. It is. You right. know, you, so you, don't kill, do it. you kill a party's horse, and the party will just eat it. Yeah. But no, 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 no. no can't kill no, a dog. That's, that's interesting because you know, in some Asian cultures, it's perfectly okay to eat a dog. Sure. So but we're, we're not, not playing that game. My dog. <laughs> but, but that's just <laughs> but, and I also, I also adhere to the. Uh, the uh, Sander Clegane uh, law of don't be a cunt and name your name your sword. Well, ah. see, I totally disagree with that. Every, this has been done. This goes back to Excalibur. Excalibur is a named weapon, right? And on all the classic D and D relic items, they're all named items. Uh, I think that was just a spiteful asshole being a spiteful asshole. Well, okay, there's a big difference between you know Excalibur and some douchebag who names his. Uh, Names his sword, you know, Blood Fang or some bullshit. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's different if it's a if it's a relic or if it's something that you know, Black Razor or something like that. Hey, totally fine. You All know, relics start out as some douchebag sword. <laughs> that's fair. that's that's a fair point. You know? No, I like. <laughs> I'm I'm definitely pro uh, naming swords because then you can, you give a chintzy plus one sword a name, then the player will get attached to it. And then they'll think twice about trading it in for something else if it has a cool name. Yeah. And, and there's always that fear of, of breakage, right? Yeah. We can break magical weapons. Uh, <laughs> and, how, and fixing them is really hard. Like, we know this. this is, it's a hurdle that's probably not going to happen unless it's really important and you're, you're nearing your 20th level as a fighter and you've had this sword for who knows how long. Right, you become attached to it. This is a part of. This is literally a part of my character at that point. So, what do you do when it breaks? And you, and these, these are things that you can play on. Yeah, you, you could create an entire campaign off of reforging a broken sword. Yep, a relic sword. Um, it's not as easy as taking it to your local elves and having them reforge it as Lord of the Rings would have you believe. <laughs> right, um, right. That's not how we would play it. No, that's a good, that's a good point. The, uh, well, and, you know, going to reforge uh, an ancient elven sword or what have you, I'm, I'm okay with that. But, you know, if it's, hey, we're going to go on this quest to go and fix my plus one sword of, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm, unless it's, it's a big story opportunity or whatever you know right. it's okay it's, but it just uh, seems a little weird right it's it's about um buying into other people's characters oh yeah uh, and that's that's a whole other can of worms is uh, is the magic of a group that is invested in each other's characters right uh, but uh i think once you get to the point where you know your players and you know their idiosyncrasies right um you can begin to play on those uh, Mike does this all the time. Mike knows his players so well. He can write entire evenings of events off of tiny little pieces of who we are, right? right. And, and I think the, that's part of the story of, uh, of player superstition is just knowing your players. Mike? That's why I enjoy new players because then they throw me curves. Whereas people I've gamed with a long time, like Jason in the channel here, I see, uh, he's seen all my bag of tricks. And uh, now with him, it's uh, I got to use stuff that I've used way long time ago because I'm sure you'll forget about it. No, he remembers the long but, time ago. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. There's, there's, a, there's a, a point. Of, like we have a 10-year gap 10 years right. back that you can go. It's like a sweet spot. Rehash. 
Right. Ah, uh, see, <laughs> I knew I knew Jason could explain the uh, locksmith woodsman of noble birth. Locksmith woodsman of noble birth. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it was for the bonuses. Yes. Right. Uh, Talking about uh, talking about Mike and his uh, exploiting everyone's idiosyncrasies. My one of my favorite stories is our friend Shannon. <clears throat> um, to go back, we uh, uh, Mike used to. We had this weird thing. It was a superstition, certainly. It was uh, that the GM's dice were cursed, and if you rolled one of the GM's dice, your dice were cursed. How and, could I forget this? Story? And it was almost it was like, beautiful. and it was almost like you know, it's almost like those people who don't like food touching. You know, and it was like, don't let Mike's dice get anywhere near your dice. You know, and I know other people who, who are like this too. You know, the, um, you know, um, friend Wayne, and if he even looks at your dice, they're, your dice are screwed, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it was one of those things. Well, not everybody has that, that superstition. And as a table, we had that. And then Shannon comes along and my, what Mike used to do is he would, he would throw one of his dice in your bag and you probably wouldn't find it for weeks. And then you're like going through, you're like, God damn it, Mike. And you throw it at him or throw it across the room. And so then here comes Shannon and she sits down she digs through and goes, there's a dice in my bag. And Mike was like, ha ha ha. And she goes, free dice. And she kept it. Oh, no. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Backfire. Yep, that, back that was my good 20. <laughs> yeah, see, sucker. Uh, you never give up. You never try and curse somebody's bag with your good 20, Mike. But the longer it's in there, the more the curse takes hold. Ah, it saturates it. Yeah. yeah. It's like an unhollow. No. <laughs> so how... How do you approach, Eric, playing on player superstitions? Because you are, for our group, you, I would say you are our second <laughs> longest running GM. And for you, especially more recently, and we'll get into this in other times, is D&D and gaming in general has become a bit of a psychological experiment to you. And, and the ways in which you can use people's personalities and and things of that nature, psychological effects to enhance the game, right? So how, how do you view player superstitions? Like, how do you want to play on them? Um, for superstitions, uh, like I said, you, you've got to really know your players or at least know people. Um, I'm not a very good poker player, but I can read people a little bit. So um, especially when I'm running a game, because if um, what I, one of the things I like to do is I set up a role play um, opportunity for the players where they're going to role play with each other. And that way I can sit back and kind of watch what they're doing and see some of the things that, they're, you know, maybe somebody's having a bad day or maybe somebody's, you know, um, really protective of some, something, uh, you know, part of their character or something like that. And um, you start looking for ways to, to exploit that. Some uh, some other superstitions like people rolling on their books and things like that. Um, we had one friend who would, if it fell off the book, he would pick it up and roll it again. And I mean, there's been a couple of times where you know they would roll roll on the on the on the book, it would fall on the table, and you could tell that oh, <laughs> I want to keep that twenty, but I can't. I can't. Yeah, and so you, you got to watch it. You're I'm not a big candy. fan of the book rule. And unfortunately, uh, the, I found the people who do this on the thing rule for dice, you know, on the table in this thing, are notoriously the worst dice rollers. And you're going right. to roll four or five, six <laughs> times before you get finally get a roll worthy. Right. Remember when we we used to make Mark roll in the in the frisbee? Yes. Remember that? Yes. It was a it was and a frisbee. I think Jason did that, didn't he? It was a frisbee that he like lined with with uh, foam or some shit mm. on the bottom of it, and and <laughs> therein lies the pro uh, lies the problem. Was you're trying to contain a roll, and he made this like spongy shit on the bottom of it. So every time he would, and he wouldn't roll like roll. It was always oh, roll flip. Yeah, and flip. so that would always bounce out. That one uh, what was it Gen Con where he rolled the one dice and it bounced off the table and it was on a, a concrete floor. It just kept going down all the way down the hall. And it was one of those rare moments where this room was like basically dead silence. It was like <laughs> yeah, you got a hundred people and line, everybody line, was line, quiet line, once. Line. Right. <laughs> Go right. on. Go on. <laughs> but yeah, that yeah, was I one like, of his big ones. <laughs> uh, sure. I like uh, a, lot of, a lot of snow has a good idea about uh, bouncing the dice off beer bottles. I, I could get into that one. 
Oh, like it doesn't count if it if it, if you get a bank shot or something like that. I well, that you know to, what uh, there there is that there is uh, something to that, right? Because how many times have you rolled a dice and it hits something and it looked like it was going to be a high number and then it banks off something and turns into a low number? Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, it was almost a, no, it wasn't almost shit, right? Right. Or what about when you're live streaming, rolling up your character and it falls on the floor and you call it, I'm taking it. And then your GM vetoes it because it fell on the floor. <laughs> that would that, never happen. That literally would never happen. You would no, never do that to no, someone. No. I'm like, oh, uh, no. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> um, that actually 100% when? happened. And I believe it was an 18, really? was it not? You ended up vetoing an 18, 18. that was called. What, 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 did someone roll three dice off the table? My and damn. And they all landed on sixes? <laughs> wow. <laughs> These things That's happen. some bad karma. Yes. This is why, this is why uh, you live stream everything. Right. So we have documented proof so that we can then harass you about it later. It's true. It's important. So true. Another, well, if it wasn't um, for that uh, botched roll on the, f- on the floor for uh, old Boshi over there, uh, right. she probably would have had all the eight teams on her stats. Actually, yes, that was, she had a very, She's, that was a pretty good character. Yeah, it was a very good character. Was this 3D6? Uh, I don't. Uh, I, it, yeah, you need to yeah, check the, You need to check those fucking dice. That's all I got. Might say. have been forty six drop one or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we. Uh, all right. We've run into other forms of superstition. <laughs> Some things that uh, it doesn't so much affect the game, but it's the way people approach approach the game. I personally, I print out a new character every level. Doesn't doesn't matter what game we're playing. If if there's a significant change, I like my. <laughs> P- fillable PDFs. I print them out because I can't see, and I like I like I like things big. I like things visible. But you have people who will never change their character sheet from from one till the end, and it's all eraser marks, right? Yep, that's and, me, and that's Mike. This guy, yeah, because the character sheet, like everything else attached to this game that we play, takes on a life of its own and becomes its own special thing, right? Um, People have binders full of old character sheets from all these games, and I guess to to their credit, not so much mine, um, they can see the the progression of a character. They can see little things, tea tea stains become, you know, the story of what happened that night, um, and all these are are super important to the player, um, and I think that's that's again how you can. You can play on people uh, because you do get so attached to these minor, minor little things. Like, what would Mike do? What like would I do? Is, you would write. Wills. Oh yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was actually on the sheet. Yeah, the, you would the, write the wills, wills, or right. or mm-hmm. you take somebody else's sheet and you inject something. And you know what? Those wills were never carried out. Well, that's a that's a problem <laughs> with, with the legal system. Right? <laughs> oh man, right. the D and D legal system. Right, Which but yeah, I, I played with lawyer? a guy. We need hmm? a Greyhawk probate lawyer. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Um, yeah, I played with a guy who every time he made a character, I think, yeah, I'm pr- pretty sure I'm thinking of the same guy. Mike played with him too, who would always put um, some sort of a stain on his character sheet, like day one, just to, like a like a coffee mug um, or something like that, just so you know, oh, it's official now. I've got a coffee stain on it, so right, we're well, ready to go. As much like my father <laughs> says. Uh, a truck isn't worthy until it's scratched, so he doesn't care. He wants it pre-scratched, right? Otherwise, then it's just too new. Right? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I like that age on a character. Because if that character is going to get up uh, you know, from first to 20, I like to see the age in the character sheet as well. If I have a 20th level character on a brand new printed out sheet, how, you know, how is someone else to know I just made that now or I've been playing that thing for years? Sure. Yeah, I, I I can see that too. I mean, I I do I I like I love looking at old character sheets. Kind of like I love, you know, you have recipes written by great grandma, right? To me, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, I I find old character sheets interesting. I love buying auction books that have people's people have left their character sheets in them, um, just to see how other people play, how other people approach their characters. Noodles <laughs> in the margins reminds um, me of uh, Marla Singer on. Uh, Fight Club, you know, it was a uh, it was a bridesmaid's dress. Every somebody loved it for one day, for one day <laughs> intensely, right? Right uh, to to somebody, and I 
I read an article some some time ago. Uh, it was a Zach Smith article uh, about personalizing things. And in this case, it was modifying his monster manual, right? And this was a foreign concept to me, uh, but I liked it. Up to that point, I'm like, my books are pristine. I like to keep them new and perfect. But then I thought, no, why? Why? Why not? Why not personalize these things? Uh, I have asked Mike to draw in my player's handbook, and that's uh, that's going on two years now, Mike. I'm still waiting for that. <laughs> Motherfucker sits at the same table as you. Draws on everything. Everything. By the way. Right. What an asshole. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, I I know what you're saying because it it's kind of like the same. Uh, I think it's some, the, the same internal drive that people have to write in a yearbook or uh, keep a scrapbook or something like that. I mean, people do these things because it, essentially what you're doing is you're you're making memories solid, right? So, I mean, just like, uh, you know, remembering that great game, you know, sometimes memories fade, but right. you, you have a, a, a substantial, you know, piece of that game right there with that character sheet for me what it got down to and why why i thought it was interesting was if i have if you take any five player handbooks right and if everyone has this concept of it's pristine nobody knows whose book is whose right unless you've written your name in it i was like well that's kind of that's kind of bad right that's a missed opportunity it's like I will know what book is mine because I know of the dents when it was dropped or, or Mike spilled tea on my book or whatever. Um, yeah. And it's personal at that point. I'm not going to sell it, right? I, I, I am an RPG speculator. I'm not going to sell it because these things become personal. And, and my, my player's handbook re- begins to reflect part of who I am and how I approach the game. Yeah, right. I'm... Um, I I guess it depends for me what game it is because some games I don't mind like selling reselling and things like that but others I I'll sit and hold on to so yeah I could see that becoming a thing where you're gonna it, it becomes your book and I'm honestly if if you've got shit written all over it chances are you're not going to it's like getting rid of a yearbook you're not right. you, you've got you know right. you, some people keep their yearbooks all their lives. You know, I can walk in the other room and look at my wife's yearbooks. Mine, I have no clue. They're probably in a landfill somewhere, you know, but you know, some people just, uh, it's a thing. I'm pretty sure I don't own a single yearbook from my entire time in high school. Yeah. The only yearbook picture I ever wanted. And I know that's like the only yearbook I didn't buy was when I had my hair down to my butt. (laughs) Ah, how we've grown. Oh Yeah. No, I can't barely, I can barely yes. grow any hair uh, on my head. Chat asks, Dan, uh, if you bought a used adventure with notes in it already, would you add it to your, would it, you add it to your own notes? Uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of snow. Uh, yes, 100%. Um, because Ooh. to me, GMing is about stealing. Oh yeah. It's, it's theft from everything. It's theft from movies, TV, books, other GMs, other games, yeah. taking everything. It's jamming is the art of theft. Right. We candy code it and say it's inspiration, but really you're just stealing right. shit. I, I believe wholeheartedly in the idea that, that new ideas are extraordinarily rare. And the most ideas somebody else somewhere has already had. Um, so why not take it? Just accept it for what it is and use it for your own purposes. I would love, I w- it's like getting pre-highlighted textbooks and you just hope the person before you was good, right? And hope <laughs> these notes aren't terrible. Uh, right. But even if they are, it's somebody's game, right? And that's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Obocop's asking, uh, at what point do you make a decision to get rid of an old game you haven't played in years? That's a good question because um, I kind of went through that, uh, that purge myself where I'm just like, I'm sitting here and I've got four bookshelves top to bottom with game books. And I'm like, <laughs> I am because never going to play that game. I'm never going to play it. is completism. It was, yeah. yeah. Certainly was. Maybe less uh, superstition, more of a compulsion, but, mm. but the need for completion uh, because, hey, there might be something cool mm. or just to have all of the thing. 
right? I'm kicking wow. myself in the ass right now because I'm like, because I backed the uh, Conan Kickstarter, right? And so I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally okay with, you know, just having the core rule book and then I'll have the PDFs, you know, <laughs> of the source books. And then we sit down to play uh, our, our first session. We just did it, uh, not this week, we did it last week. Sit down for a, a session zero and our friend Aaron starts pulling out all the books that he got from the Kickstarter from Don't phase one. <laughs> I, I, I went out that day and oh. ordered all the rest of them. <laughs> so unfortunate. Yeah, because I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I got to. And, and I am the complete opposite of that. I am a core rule book person. I col- and I collect games. I, I collect them and I hope to never have to get rid of them. <laughs> um, but I'm fairly selective about these things, right? So I would, I would never, at this point, I would say I would never get rid of a game book, ever. Um, I would kind of the same way. sooner give it away or lend it away and never get it back than, than just sell it that. <laughs> I have this whole set of uh, deadlands here that uh, I'm not getting rid of. Right. And and why would you? Because there's <laughs> good Stan, stuff. It's, it's, it's your stuff. I know. It's my <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you're, so basically, you're just storing it for him. That's awesome. Exactly. Now you know. <laughs> well, because I got to a point, I moved, right? And we were doing right. a little bit of, of Old West. And, I, you know, I'm not super into Old West. I like Weird West. Um, so I was like, I have this whole book. Does anybody want to check this stuff out? You know, I, I want to me, I think a, a book loses its value if nobody's reading it. Right. I think somebody needs to be getting some value out of it. So Mike is storing it for me, much like Jason is storing all of Mike's comics, right? These <laughs> things find a home where they should be. For a time there, uh, Sean was uh, storing all um, romance novels for somebody. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Sean's <laughs> prolific romance novel collection. As uh, Jason mentions in chat, uh, he will sell people's books, even if he has no problem selling other people's. Oh books. God, no! He, he I mean, he, no. There's a uh, the famous story of him uh, selling. Uh, what was it? It was a whole stack of uh, White Wolf books. White Wolf books that he yeah. found. That he. That was like a mountain of. Books. <laughs> right. Takes him yeah. back the next year, turns it for a profit. Hey, it's a, it's all pure profit. So, but talking about uh, keeping game books and and whatnot, um, I mean, Mike, you've got books right behind your head right now that, uh, you know, the funny thing about that is 10, 15 years ago, you could probably get those in the recycle bin somewhere. Now, they're, the price is going up and up and up. So, it's just one of those weird things where things that were at one time basically worthless are now super expensive because i mean people thought they were worthless and threw them away yeah yeah uh i like to keep books that i treasure on shelves like this uh i get a book maybe to answer the earlier question i get books that i like intrinsically i might not necessarily ever want to play these games or whatever but i like We've got a couple of editions of uh, Shadowrun, Venera Belt, and I like those books. I, I like the artwork and, and whatnot, so I always keep those on my shelves. I, I don't store them away or anything. Uh, well, and here, here's another strange superstition that, that generally was a uh, benefit to the group is, Eric, you and Mark, and I believe Greg, there's a handful of you that would all do this. You would have these giant bags and you would bring every book for the game that was being played. It didn't matter how many it was. You would bring everything to the game. Right. Everybody would bring every book. Every so it, it, not only did you have one person with every book, you had three people with every book. Uh, yeah, they used to call, they had the, the uh, L5R bag of death because I think if it fell on somebody, it would literally kill them. Because there were so many books in there, yeah, and that were, Greg used like, to lug that thing. It was like a yeah. hockey bag full it was a of books. Hockey bag, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's crazy. And th- to think now, you know, that all of that stuff could be kept on a pad. And I mean, initially, you know, I'm I'm an old guy, right? I'm an old gamer. I, I'm like, oh, you know, pads. It's just not the same. I like to flip through my books. Sure, I like to flip from, through my books. But now that uh, PDF readers have become a lot more 
you know, user friendly. I mean, they've they've always been sophisticated, I guess, but you know, it's just uh, I've started to learn the software. I guess now I'm like, when I uh, when I'm uh, planning a, an adventure, I'm usually going PDF because I'm you know I've got m- multiple tabs open on my computer and I'm bouncing between things as opposed to turn around, flip, 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 or having a whole bunch of open books like laying around me like uh you know waiting for shit to happen to them like like a cat to shit on them or something so you know which well happens happens. puke usually um story (sighs) you know so it's a win in the end it's a win because it's a story so so you (laughs) have so you have a group of players and they come to your game and they have these giant duffel bags full of books Mm. because it's their superstition. They don't want to be without the knowledge, right? They want to right. know and argue a particular rule or they want to have the right ability at the right time. So how do you, as a GM, say, how do you pick and choose? Because we know about power creep. We know about how splat books can bloat and ruin games. We've seen this uh, all the time. There are many editions of many games. So how do you talk to that player? who brings their five, six hundred dollars worth of books and say, well, I'm sorry, but you can't use that. Yeah. You, well, it's first and foremost, game. first and foremost, you need to have that conversation early. Yes. Yeah. Or ahead of time. Right. Hey, I'm going to run Pathfinder. I understand there's 6,000 books for Pathfinder and you own two copies of each one, but I'm only running core rules. I'm sorry that hurts your feelings. I'm sorry that you went through all that trouble of buying all of these things. And if you want to use all that source material, you run a game. Right. You know, and, and I won't, I won't dictate what can and can't be used in your game, but if it's my game and I only, I want to keep it simple and I want to keep it. So the, the playing field is equal because of course they're going to say, well, anybody can use my book false because <laughs> you, you're going to loan your book out to somebody and either a, they're, they're going to treat it re- with respect, which they should, or they're going to take it home and forget it, or they're going to drop it or get something on it or lose it. So unless it's somebody you really trust, you're not going to give them their, their book. And nobody wants to play a character that the source material for their character is in somebody else's book that you don't get to look at when you're at home. And the only time you get to see it is when you're at game. Nobody wants well, it, to do that. And it becomes a point where... And I never thought I would think this, right? Uh, going back, the, there's a concept of pay to win, right? And this goes pay back, to win. pay to win. Uh, for me, uh, that originated with Magic the Gathering. Like, to me, that's where that kind of started. I never thought D&D or, or a role-playing game would be a pay to win game, but Pathfinder can become <laughs> that, right? With, with all the splat books. And that's, that's why we get to the point where, you know, you, you cherry pick and you pick and choose what, what books you allow but if you pay and you know because you own the books, you can pay to win. You can pay to have the best character at the table in, in a game like that. So that's how you would get to the point of, of wanting to ban books, right? But oh, yeah. that's a difficult conversation to have. Oh, yeah. With Without a doubt. Players. Without a doubt. Because, I mean, some people, uh, you, you're, a lot of times, you, they're your friends. Right. And you don't want to upset your friends. You don't want to have, I mean, some people do, but you know, most people don't want to upset their friends and you want to want them to have fun. I want you to play what you want to play. Yeah. Well, what I want to play is in that book. You won't let me play. I mean, we've had that conversation many times when it came to, it was like a third party, third edition, uh, uh, swashbuckler book. And there was a couple of character, like a couple of feats or something in it, like Back Brothers and a couple of other things that people could play. And it was it was way too OP. And Mike ended up banning it from our game. And it was like it's a rare day. Mike <sighs> brings the ban hammer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was nothing. Brian took advantage of. Oh well, imagine that. Um, <laughs> he was looking for any angle, any angle he could find. Yeah, well, because his superstition was other people getting over on him, being better than him, right? He wanted to be the baddest character at the table. Um, and and mm-hmm. we see this. I mean, this is not an uncommon trait. Uh, I, I would say that you probably have seen people like this come and go at your shop or maybe even as a part of your current game. Uh, so how do you, do you 
work with that? Do you call it out or do you ignore it? Well, I guess this, I guess it depends this, on what you're need. what you're really wanting to do. I mean, if it if it serves a purpose, then call it out. If it's a problem at the table, then call it out. I mean, there's a lot of gamers out there who equate uh, character weakness with personal weakness, and you know they don't want to show any signs of personal weakness uh, amongst their peers. So they're going to try and play the baddest ass character ever. You know, mostly because they fear failure. And so, you know, if I've got somebody who um, is like that, I've got to be the biggest and the baddest, um, then generally I know what buttons to push to get them to react to something. You know, question how badass they are or do something that would be humiliating to the character. Uh, One of our stories is, um, we were playing Shadowrun and Brian was notorious for, we'd get that, get together to play and he'd start to play and then he'd get a booty call and he would ditch us for his booty call. And so I was like, we were right in the middle of the game and all of a sudden he was like, Oh, I got to go. And yeah, you know, I was like, man, fuck you. So I was like, oh. so what ended up happening was his character, it was in the sewer and uh, his character left left the group and some i you know it's shadow run um, somebody it's just like today right uh, somebody's recording it somewhere and so i ran that as a as a like an ongoing gag where him running away from the fight was the opening credits to a fake trid show that i came up with called world's stupidest shadow runners and yeah, like you know, kind of like an america's funniest home videos but for games. but it was yeah it was all shadow run fails and so and i would oh, they would, under his skin oh my so god bad. and it was so because because it, it's just like uh you know it's just like what friends when joey was the cover boy for like chlamydia or some shit um it, it, you know it's like you don't want to be associated with that his character tabloid was, yeah, it was tabloid television. He was, yeah. he he was labeled as this, you know. Oh, hey, you know. He and one of the, Brian's other big things was he wanted to be famous. He, you know, in his he wanted his characters to all be famous, yeah. and so I made his character famous in that. Aren't you that guy on the co- on the very beginning of World Stupidest Shadowrunners? Hard to live that down, right? <laughs> but you don't have Eric. Now this might come as a surprise to you you don't have to be a dick right huh we, i don't understand i understand yeah, I, I, <laughs> you're gonna have to clarify <laughs> bear with me just for a moment okay right. let's say you have that player right who who wants to be the biggest and wants to be the baddest right it's like it's how you treat the hulk you aim them in a direction that benefits your story and you, it goes, oh, yeah. because then you know right you know how a player is going to react we had a we had another player in our group um, whose answer to every scenario was charge charge yeah. charge everything so it's when you have a player like that, leroy jenkins leroy jenkins you you can design scenarios around knowing what way they're going to go and you it's oh, yeah. basically like you're pulling them in a certain direction right um and you can do this with all kinds of types of characters right once you know what they are you pull them you pull them in the direction that you want so it gives that illusion of yeah. choice right yeah it's all it's all it's all the hooks right it's right. that's I'm how you hook you them all, into doing things i'm giving you all these choices even though in the back of my mind i have a pretty good idea <laughs> i know what you're going to choose uh, so I can, and then i can then write my adventure or my scenario around it right players are satisfied we get to a place that the story kind of may need to go uh and if they don't and so be it, you know. Um, but you can, as Mike would always say, you can only prepare so much. It's right? true. So you use your player superstitions, you use their personality quirks uh, to your advantage as a GM. Right. Mike. Uh, yeah, I like uh, when things go like the way I plan. But then on the other hand, I'm also sometimes I'll throw out a really easy encounter let's say something that's so innocuous that it's not even a challenge to the pcs and you'll get a lot of mileage out of that sure Uh, because the players all of a sudden 
have uh, maybe a chance to show off or you know maybe push around this creature or character or whatever uh, we spent an entire beginning yeah. of a campaign some years ago based on these these ideas right brian's need to be the best right um a best duelist so it became we rather than going dungeon delving we began competing um because if i remember i think it was it coincided with an olympics and we were doing the equivalent of ren fair games like jousting matches and we we went into all these other types of of genre specific games based upon the idea of taking these things that our characters want to do and be the best at and it became brian's thing he wanted to be the best <laughs> duelist right um and then we had another character who, who was a jouster uh, another character who threw through knives of course i mean these are all class specific kind of things that that fit um but we ended i think we did about five levels worth of stories just around these types of events and following circuits um because the, the oh, players no, wanted to be the best as as i recall that was actually it was around an olympics but it was also very loosely based off of a knight's Club. tale oh oh which i <laughs> fucking can't stand uh, <laughs> uh, by the way. Um, and that was the the classic mike tyler durdened me with my favorite movie fight Club. oh yeah um that was that was the uh, the character that i played then um but you can do these things because you knew your players yeah. right you knew who we are you know who we are these are these are not the kind of things that you can do in your random pickup game at a, at a shop these are these are your long-term games these are your i know these people better or as good as i know myself kind of games uh, the renfair thing you mentioned just reminded me uh, we had been doing a lot of uh, backyard things at jason's house on game nights throwing knives shooting bows one thing we haven't done is uh, jousting this is a good point yeah. yes yeah. i'm all for this maybe we could do like uh in the driveway we could do roller chair jousting Ooh, roller chair chesting. This this <laughs> is worth streaming. Yeah. And it's going yeah. to, this is how Jackass. right, this is how internet yeah. videos happen. This is how memes occur, right? It's like, why would they do this? Yeah. Well, because there was potential XP on the line <laughs> is the answer in this yeah. case. Because right. there is always XP on the line in Mike's in Mike's Ren Fair game. Brandon Bullseye. <laughs> Brandon did bullseye. I, I got him a yeah. uh, bag Pretty of level. gold. Um, but yes, <laughs> he, right. he bullseyed. Because that reminds me, do. reminds me when we were kids. Uh, Mike and I used to play uh, gladiators, and uh, uh, Mike would ride his bike, and he'd have a wiffle ball bat, and I had a homemade grappling hook, and I would try and hook his bike and knock him off his bike oh, with man. the grappling hook. Yes. Oh, yeah, fun. We had. man, if we would have just had the internet back then. Mm. We were wild back then. Yeah. First <laughs> Very spokes. And right. Oh yeah, trying to yeah stick shit in your spokes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And it was always on like asphalt too. It was never like on grass. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Yeah. American mm -hmm. Gladiators. Now that dates it right there. American Gladiators. Was the early 90s. <laughs> right. 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 So, yeah, I mean, so with, with player superstitions, you have game master su superstitions too. Sure. You know, sure. you know, I, I'm going to roll behind the, the, behind the screen or, you know, I'm going to, you know, use certain um, monsters or whatnot because, you know, the, the players won't expect them or maybe they're my, I, I really like them or I really have had good experiences uh, with players, you know. Or conversely, you know your players have had horrible experiences with a particular monster and all you have to do is bring that out. Right. And you know, it ups the game a little bit. It creates some tension um, or it, it creates maybe a little bit of ire because we always hate every time and mike we know mike is going to do this we will fight sturgy because they're terrible yeah, yeah. and we yeah. all had a horrible uh, sturgy yeah, moment yeah, right you always get the best reaction of sturgy yeah exactly it's about getting a reaction making making people get invested in in the scenario right right well it's like uh what was it uh for for years and years um if we ever encountered a bald NPC, Jason would want to put him to death because he automatically assumed it was a psionicist. Well, that's fact. 
It's just fat. <laughs> I guess I guess psionic power just makes your hair follicles just kind of yeah. like yeah, they like make you lose your hair. So I you guess many minds. Yeah. I guess you you brought you brought it up. Uh kind of part of the uh, the tagline for the show is going behind the GM screen. There is no greater player superstition or tool than the GM screen. Um, yeah. a lot of people have kind of gotten away from it. I still really enjoy the GM screen. Oh, um, because I think it's a it's an important tool on creating tension. And what did they roll? What are they rolling for? How much right. did they roll? Um, anything that you can withhold from the player to make them wonder, I think, is is a good thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I I know that. Yeah, the the modern trend, I guess, is more. Uh, you know. Uh, inclusive game mastering where you're, you know, it, we're going to share this, uh, the story experience. And I, that's fine. You know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, like the, the grade schools that are non-traditional that, uh, you know, the teachers sit, sit on the circle. floor and everybody yeah. sits in a circle and you get a, you know, you get a happy face or a, you know, or a, an ice cream cone emoji or some shit you Whoa, know those are your I grades an ice cream cone emoji right now <laughs> so i mean it's yeah sure i mean you want to sit around and and you know sit in your birkenstocks and and talk about uh you know talk about feeling gaming and all that stuff that's fine yeah that's if that's what you're into and i i can see gm screen for something like that no right yeah, i mean other than maybe for reference or whatever but you know uh, and i i can see where some people will look at uh, a gm screen as a barrier right it's a it's a protective barrier that separates the players from the game master you know physically as well as metaphorically or whatever but you know um for me it's it, it does create that uh sense of wonder because when you're rolling out in the open I, and i'm a big proponent of rolling out in the open because i don't want anybody thinking i'm i'm you know cheating them or anything like that i'm gonna roll it right out there in the open and if so that way you can see that you know your character just bought it right i'm not pulling any punches um but sometimes i will roll behind a screen just to just for effect sometimes because it's just like uh there's nothing more demoralizing to a, a player, especially an uppity player who feels like the, you know, they're, they're playing, like you said, the big badass, and they can't, you know, they can't fail and all that stuff. And they roll their dice and, and shadow run and they go, Oh, I just got, uh, you know, this. And then they hear the, the cascading the, waterfall yes, of dice. The waterfall of dice. Yeah. yeah and, the and you just watch your face, face go, huh. Mm. And then you're like, you know, uh, that to me. Can we describe how bad a character is, right? Visually or by reputation, but you hear 30 dice drop, <laughs> you know, right? Better right. than any description, the, di- the dice tell the story. Right. And then, well, of course, there's, and then it, then it escalates, right? Because it, it's like, you know, oh, my, my, back in the day, it was, oh, my sixes exploded. So I go, I go you know, cascading waterfall of dice. And then, you, then I'm picking up more, Pick up and then the another six. cascading waterfall of dice. So then, then yeah, that's pretty demoralizing. And, um, yeah, that's... It, but not only just that. I mean, I a kid, but you know, it's a, rolling behind a, a screen. Sometimes you you got to do it, and you know, sometimes you're rolling, and you don't even keep what you roll. You know, just go, huh. you know, hey, you you succeeded, or you know, whatever. I don't like to roll behind a screen and and suggest that somebody failed because I think that's you know, uh, I think it's kind of cheap if it's a if it's a pass fail kind it's of budget. thing. Hmm. It's a double edged sword because you could. Oh, right. Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, so it kind of almost comes to the point where I think now that we're talking about this, if you're, if you're using a GM screen, you almost have to all in it, right? You can't, you can't do that. Oh, I'm going to roll this one out in front of you. So, you know, I'm not fudging. It has, there has to be a buy-in. The players have to know that you're not fudging um, so that every roll is true. So you never, so when you do fudge, for whatever reason you might want to fudge it, um, generally to, to move things along when like players fail, but you never want them to know that that's the case, right? Because I think for the most part, at least in our groups and the groups that I've seen, nobody wants to be handed success, nope. right? That's why we have dice. Um, you can play games where success is assumed and, and you can do those type of story Story, what I would almost more consider a story exercise or story building game. Um, but when you have dice, 
there's a sense of I've earned it or the randomness has now given validity to, to, to my success or my failure. Um, it's not my fault. The dice fucked me, right? How, how often do you say that? <laughs> the dice fucked me. <laughs> yeah. So that's why whenever it's an important role, you bring out your big 20. That's right. right. You bring out the dice that doesn't fail you. Right. Yeah. And if, and God forbid he forgot that dice or couldn't find it, it was like looking for his whoopee. Oh, everything it, comes to a stop, right? Right. The it was game like, game is over until I find my dice. My big 20. I got to find big 20. It's like he's looking for his crack. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but yeah, um, you, you gotta, you gotta give props though. That dice was, and I, I don't re- recall it rolling higher than anything, but he always reacted so like exuberantly whenever it was like he would roll a 20. He's like, Oh, I, I, I really gotta, I really gotta score big on this one. And you know, it was a fight or something like that. And he, you know, he'd always say that, Oh, big 20, it's a lover, not a fighter. That's crap. Right. Um, he would, he would go to big 20 whenever it was a big fight or he really needed a, a hit or something. He would go to it because he knew that, you know, and one of the other things that uh, we would hear or, or be said a lot is you got to give a fuck. If you don't right. give a fuck, you're not going to, you're not going to do well on your roll. You got to give a fuck uh, like that really matters. But um, Hey, if it does, it does, you know, it, and I mean, there's it's nothing more like, satisfying. Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's a lot like poker, right? You remember your wins. You oh, yeah. don't remember your defeats so much. And that, that, that's like how the legacy of Big 20, something like this occurs, right? You remember the successes because you build them up and it's really important, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, the successes, are, you know, you think, uh, you know, Stranger Things, you know, it's a success and everybody at the table stands up in tears. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know, and that's, that's the legend of Big 20. That, you know, the more times than not, I can remember us screaming at the table and, you know, and then hearing Brian's parents upstairs, boom, 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 shut up, you know, that kind of thing because of a bit of the big 20. I'd like to point out along, along those lines, um, gaming in the basement, I would like to say that I'm the only one doing this correct because I am the only one (laughs) actually in a basement. basement. So I'm lending legitimacy to this, uh, because this is an actual basement D and D game. Well done. Uh, the way it's supposed to be. That's right. All right. All right. So uh, hmm? I was going to say one sided die in the chat is uh, doing algebra. <laughs> it's hurting my head. Uh, don't look. It'll 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 ruin your night. You won't be able to sleep. All right. Well, um, we're about at time. So, uh, really? yep. Yep. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, make sure you follow us if you want to You know, know when we're going to be on. Uh, we, sh- we will be on. Um, what's today the 13th so 27th we'll be on the 27th at 9 p.m central yeah. uh thanks we for joining will, us uh, continue to uh fumble Hi. through this until we figure it out uh thank you for joining yeah, us on our right. inaugural episode uh yeah. and we hope to see you again all right bye everybody